Welcome, this is Hugh Massey, the CEO and founder of DNA Behaviour International. In today's webinar, I'm going to talk to you about building a behavioural based investment portfolio using the risk profile that we have uh, determined from the financial DNA uh, discovery process and uh, 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 applying that, both on uh, behavioural and uh, financial factors. That was addressed in the, in the prior webinar. So once we've determined the, uh, the risk profile of the client, um, this table can be used to uh, design uh, the portfolio. Now what I'd like to emphasize here is that uh, the asset allocation contained in here will be different uh, for every firm and depending on their policies and procedures and uh, belief systems about portfolios it definitely will be different across countries. Now for example what we find is that the Canadian uh, portfolios for Canadian uh, resident clients or Australian resident clients for example will be different to, to America but the uh, the risk profile determined is still uh, is still the same for for a person in the sense that if they are a a middle range risk risk profile then they would fall in group four and they would uh, be allocated a, a balanced portfolio that that looks something uh, um, like this that's designed to um, uh, you know be in part uh, defensive and then in part uh, growth so. The principles here are the same worldwide, um, but the but the potential allocations uh, as as we move in the in the build up of the portfolio might be might be different. But assuming it's homogeneous, then this table uh, works at a, at a at a at a standard level. And the idea is just to to show you that uh, once we um, move up from the group four middle range portfolio that's meant to be balanced and we get to group five, for example, which is more accumulation and growth, then there will be a higher proportion of our equity allocation, uh, potentially some more uh, alternatives. And also the, uh, the investment style is also important uh, uh, down, down, down lower down here in that uh, a more passive uh, investment uh, uh, management approach, for example, using exchange traded funds or ETFs, uh, will generally be uh, better and safer for um, the uh, the group four and down, but uh, those that are in group five, six, and seven may wish to veer away from uh, a uh, passively managed uh, portfolio and get a bit more spice and kick in their portfolio, and, and of course take more risk from it being actively managed. And then for the uh, the group one, basically what we're saying is that uh, all of the money uh, or the portfolio can be invested in cash or short term uh, bonds because it's meant to be for 100% capital protection. This is in essence the uh, the financial uh, reserves that are required to meet uh, the needs of day to day life for a younger person who's got a good secure job. They don't need as much put away in, in the group one, whereas those who are older would, would need more, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So this is what it looks like on the, uh, the pie chart here. So for the group seven, not as much money allocated to fixed income and a lot more to uh, uh, equities and the, and the alternative investments. Again, I wish to emphasize this is an indicative model only and will be adjusted for each firm globally uh, based on uh, their markets and investment policies. And how do we go about building the portfolio? Uh, sort of the strategic approach that we take um, is that there would be three uh, portfolio buckets uh, with dollars allocated to each uh, based on uh, the client's goals, their needs and wants, their financial ability and the risk profile. Um, a different portfolio uh, risk profile can be uh, allocated to each bucket um, if required to make the, the portfolio more customized. And, and then the um, uh, asset allocation is determined for each portfolio bucket 
and uh, and then how the money is going to be managed versus in in terms of passive versus active. So here are the uh, the three portfolio buckets that we uh, uh, use. In a way, this is what's called a mental accounting approach in the sense that there is a uh, inherent segmentation in the overall portfolio, and in a way, each bucket can be uh, uh, separately managed. Although I would suggest that needs to be watched over time, and there needs to be some rebalancing. So being too fixated on uh, uh, and overstructuring this can uh, cause uh, inherent uh, problems uh, of itself uh, at, at, at a behavioral level and an operating level. But the, the operating portfolio, which is really the, uh, the preservation portfolio, is uh, uh, designed to uh, provide for a principle that uh, will provide uh, the cash for you know, daily living uh, to meet the short-term um, needs and uh, some of the short-term wants. Um, as I said before, for a younger person, they might have, uh, you know, six months cash uh, on hand uh, if they're being uh, relatively conservative. For older people, they might have uh, a lot more cash on hand, um, particularly when they're retired, just to be conservative. So it's all invested effectively in cash and. Uh, uh, you know, non-volatility uh, positions. The capital appreciation is probably the uh, the portfolio bucket that, uh, as the planner, you would concentrate on the most in terms of uh, building the uh, the client's wealth to uh, uh, give them the retirement capital that they need to meet their long-term uh, needs. So this would be the five to ten-year horizon type portfolio. And depending on their risk profile, uh, they will get a grouping of uh, uh, two to seven, which would drive the uh, the, the the portfolio uh, in that respect, and then the strategic portfolio is more the uh, what's used for speculative money uh, to help people uh, meet a special objective, generate high returns, uh, do something that's a little bit uh, different. But the client here can also afford to lose. So really, this would be funding long-term wants, uh, not long-term needs, and it's generally uh, better for those uh, clients who've got a risk portfolio grouping of five or more. Um, but of course, this depends on the person and how much money they have. And I, I would always emphasise that in you know designing the uh, the portfolio buckets, it's 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 also important to remember that what's the level of investment experience that the uh, the person has and their level of investment education. And the higher that is, then you can be a little bit more liberal with. Uh, you know, moving the client towards a strategic portfolio for at least part of it. But if the client is not investment educated, then the strategic portfolio can become very dangerous because they won't understand what they're investing in, which ultimately will lead to more emotions. In the uh, the next uh, webinar, uh, we're going to be talking uh, more about uh, the behavioral finance biases. Uh, so those biases that uh, um, drive the cognitive influences on uh, decision making and uh, you know, influence how someone looks at their portfolio, how they make decisions, the types of factors that they will take into account uh, in terms of how they're wired in, in making decisions.